What's up everybody, NEXT here, and welcome to your 360 virtual reality tour of the Luxor Temple of Man. And why do we call it the Temple of Man? That is not the standard Egyptological attribution. Most Egyptologists will tell you there is no Temple of Man. Temples are consecrated to the various deities. Here in Luxor we have Amun during the New Kingdom. But according to the symbolist interpretation of R.A. Schwale de Lubitsch, French chemist, alchemist, hermeticist, he dubbed it the Temple of Man. And the reason for that is because the, after an intensive study that took him about 15 years, he discovered it. the proportions, geometries, the volume, the orientation, the, the reliefs, the esoteric symbolism and reliefs, lighting, color, all of it gives us the sum of man so in the simplest sense because it's a very complex it's, it even comes down to the joints and the actual courses of stone and the way that they align uh, with different parts of the temple and the hidden occult anatomy <clears throat> we're now in the great courtyard of Ramses we won't be able to go over the whole symbolist approach tonight it's very complex you can refer to my forthcoming esoteric symbolist guidebook to the Luxor Temple of Man, which is based on the work of R.A. Schwale de Lubitsch, Temple of Man, which is a two-volume set. I actually have to come back here to get a photo if you want to learn more. Anyway, we're now in the courtyard of Ramses. This is the shrine of Ramses, which is actually usurped. It was originally, there's a lot of clues here that show us that this was originally consecrated to Tutmosis and Hatshepsut. So this was likely a shrine or a way station that was part of the Opet festival. Let's see if I can find the photo I'm looking for. And actually, so this is interesting because this is one of the parts of the simplest brooch. So if you look at the courses of stone in the wall, you'll see the lines, the different joints. In some cases, we'll go through the knees and that is actually where we're coming up upon over here the knee in the human body so the the pylons correspond to the feet as you're coming through you're walking through the soles of the feet and then this part here would be the lower leg and as you come up here your eyes are taken right into the striding colossi taking the left foot forward why left there's many reasons for that, symbolic reasons. The left side is also the side of the body that we find the heart. And for the ancient Egyptians, the heart was considered the seat of consciousness. But here we have the seated colossi. And this represents the knee. You can actually see a line going through the stone here which Schwaller believes is intentional. You see that line going right through this famous scene known as the Sematawi, which is the unification of the two lands. We have the statue for Yoya and Toya. Yoya and Toya, grandparents of King Totenkamu. This guy's telling everybody that that's the statues of Yuya and Toya, the grandparents of King Tut. But I don't know where he gets that information because the entire statue has been usurped with cartouches. We don't know who it is. Actually, a lot of people believe that it is King Tut. If you look at his face, it looks like the boy king. Others believe it was usurped from Amenhotep III. We don't know. No Egyptologist can say with certainty. This guy certainly can't say with certainty. But what we can say is that the statues were, uh, whoever it's depicting, that it was the king in deified form, essentially representing Amun and Mut, which, or Amunet, which was uh, the, the two consorts of Amun. So the king would take on the role of Amun. And that's what it is. Essentially, it's Amun and Mut. Or Amunet. 
Anyway, we're in a great colonnade now. This corresponds to the femur bone. You'll notice there is in total 14 columns here, seven on each side. Seven is the number of uh, cyclical pro and process cycle, cyclical regeneration, seven days of the week, seven notes on a musical scale, seven visible colors, seven chakras, seven psychic centers. You need seven to complete a full cycle, right? And so it's interesting because here on the west side, the reliefs depict part of the Opet Festival starting at the Karnak Temple and going all the way to the, here to the Luxor Temple. This is a festival that would take place to rejuvenate the king, legitimizing and rejuvenating his power. Then it starts from Luxor and it goes all the way back to Karnak, thus completing a cycle. So it's appropriate here that you have the Opet Festival depicted all along the wall, which ends with an image of a feast where he is over there. You can see all the food items. And that is the part of the femur bone. Again, we're in the femur bone of the human body. That is the part of the femur bone where you have the, the highest concentration of red corpuscles. Essentially, it's the blood factory. So the, it's what nourishes the body. So it's appropriate that you'd have a feast in the part of the body that is giving nourishment to the body. Anyway, we're now entering what is formerly known as the sun court or the solar court because it was open to the sky however oh and interestingly enough right over here is where they found the Luxor cachette what is the Luxor cachette it is the amazing what John Anthony West referred to as some of the most remarkable statuary in all of Egypt we're now standing where they found it right in this section here was a giant cache where they hid all these statues that if you ever have the opportunity to check out the Luxor Museum as soon as you walk into the right there's a room with all the really remarkable statues that they unearthed from here statues of Amun one of the best statues ever of Amenhotep III so this is the part of the body that corresponds to uh, well several things you have the reproductive region and one of the symbolic clues for that we find ithophallic min right where the male phallus would be over here is where the wrists would line up with the body in a typical uh scale the canon the human canon in other words if you were to take a image of a typical male skeleton and superimpose it over an aerial view of the temple everything corresponds that is because the biometric makeup of the human body, all the geometries and proportions inherent in the human body are incorporated into the temple. And there's also a unique axis in this temple, three axis in fact, that Schwaller identified. And every hall, wall, and colonnade is determined by one of these axes. This of course runs much deeper. I go into more detail in my forthcoming book. This is also where the navel of the human body is, and right up there on the architrave, it references how this was the place where the king is given birth, which is interesting because the navel corresponds to the biblical cord where we're given birth. And here is where they celebrate giving the house to the master, giving the temple to the master. So you can see, oh, you can't really see because it's dark. But up here you have images of the king making offerings to our moon and he's offering him the temple. It's a consecration just like a birth and it's at birth when we take our first breath that the vital life force fuses with humanity. But if you look closely some of the esoteric symbolism encoded in the temple here you'll notice something unusual about the drums of the columns. You'll see they're in this crescent shape. This is the part of the temple that corresponds to the lungs. The lungs and the moon respectively in astrology uh, correspond to the sun and the moon. So we're in the section that would correspond to the moon, thus the lungs. So what do you find? You find crescent shaped moons. Not only do you find crescent shaped moon, but it's the waxing and waning, all the different stages of the waxing and waning of the moon here in the covered temple floor plan. This entrance is sealed up. This used to be uh, 
chamber for Kansu, and then his mother Moot, who again was a Kansu out of Amun, and Shual of the Lubits found this space here. If you take this space and you overlay it over the temple plan, um, there is the floor plan was made of what appears to be all haphazard stone mosaics. It matches the articulations of the face of the king. Although some of the stones are modern, for example here, these stairs, so it's hard to make out now. Whoa, um, yeah, they all know me here. We're now in the heart of the temple. This is where the Romans plastered over the ancient Egyptian reliefs. We're now in the hall of the offerings. And this is, they refer, this is the Holy of Holies. It's not the original Holy of Holies. This is actually uh, Alexander the Great's construction here inside the older temple. You can see the evidence for that right here on the floor. These, this is where there would have been columns, four columns. Four is the number, esoteric number associated with uh, substance, material, manifestation. We're now in the coronation room. This is where Schwaller looks at the slope in the joints and sees that it corresponds to the uh, pylon of the temple and on both sides of the wall. It actually starts from right here and then it goes up on an, you can see it cuts up right through here on an angle and it corresponds to the pylon. This is the birthing chamber or hall of theogamy. Here's the famous scene here where you have the two Neteru. You have Selkit, right? You see the scorpion and you have Neith with the cross, very old motif. They're seated on a plinth. They're holding up Moot and Amun. He has a double plume headdress and you notice they're above their their, their feet on touching the ground, they're held up so they're in the sky. So this is, you can think of this uh, in terms more metaphysical or spiritual terms, right? It's, I want to say mythological, but this isn't exactly taking place in the physical world entirely because our moon is a deity. This is the mother of Amenhotep III. And he. this is essentially what he's doing. This is a soft core scene here. The hands are slightly in an embrace with his right arm. He's holding an unk, which is now the face to the nose, which is giving her life. He's actually giving her life. The scene starts over here. This is the virgin birth, 1500 years before Christianity. This is the Annunciation. This same principle is taken out of Egypt and repeated in uh, biblical tradition. Um, so the scene actually starts over here and it's very unique because this whole thing wraps around in a zigzag pattern all through the wall and you have the theme on this world symbolically representing the birth, the divine birth, and then you have uh, the purification and then they go through the said festival so you have um, initiation if you will and then you have the celebration of the victory. The whole thing, the scene starts on a lower register, it runs all the way to the from right to left and then it wraps back around this way and it zigzags and then it connects all the way around and what's interesting over here is you have the king is slaughtering the orcs this animal it looks like an antelope it's it's an orcs he's holding it by the horns with his left hand with his right hand he's cutting its throat he is killing it destruction then the birth is announced creation birth so you have death life you have destruction creation coming together it's right where this whole thing wraps around and the death takes place death is not an ending in esoteric tradition death is a new beginning it's a transition and that's what we have we have new birth so the cycle is repeated absolutely amazing esoteric symbolism in this room often overlooked by the casual tourists most tour guides don't even recognize this but what they do recognize on the surface level is here 
you know this is the same as when the angel comes and tells mary that she in the biblical tradition she's about to have a divine birth jehu the the cosmic principle of wisdom who later becomes known as uh toth or tahuti or toth depending which pronunciation you want to subscribe to jehu or tahuti is the ibis headed ibis head on the body of a man he can also take in later ptolemaic times it takes the form of a baboon but Jehuti is now informing Amun of the good news that the, she, the mother of Amun Hotep has been notified. And here is the virgin birth, where essentially the, the god is impregnating the human. She gives birth to Amun Hotep III, which legitimizes him because she wasn't legit in her lineage. We know it's her cartouche over here. We can see the cartouche moot. M Wea, Muta Wea, right? Mut and uh, T to feminize it, and then the owl M, and then Wea, Muta Wea. So she wasn't, uh, you know, he, he wasn't essentially a legitimate king. This is the way he legitimized himself. But this is a tradition that goes back in antiquity. Hatshepsut, you know, proclaims herself as Pharaoh in a similar fashion, and even before that. And then we have a moon again. He's standing before Kanum. The, the head of uh, Kanum is he who fashions humanity on the potter's wheel. You can see he's instructing Kanum here. Kanum gives birth to Amenhotep III, but there's two of them. Why? Because it's not that he had a twin, but this is his Ka. When you're born, you're born with your uh, spiritual double. So it's Amenhotep and his Ka and before the sacred divine principle and then up here you have jehuti announcing again this is the annunciation in christianity 1500 years before the principle is repeated in the bible here on the walls in egypt then you have jehuti announcing the word and all the way through here they have the attendants helping through the birth scene and again the whole thing wraps around absolutely amazing we come over here <laughs> Now we're entering the offering chamber here, which is sometimes referred to as the Hall of Twelve. You have 12 columns here, 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night. You have esoteric symbolism in east and west with the, uh, with the boats on each side as well as, well, I'll show you over here. The east is a symbol for unrealized potential, unmanifest, un right? So spirit manifests into matter, matter returns to spirit. So here on the here on the east side of the temple, you have the uh, you have the animals that are about to be slaughtered in the sacrifice, they're tied up and trussed, their tummies are facing us this way, stomachs facing this way. But when we move over here to the west, again keep in mind the east is unmanifest, west is is like death the sun rises because the ancient egyptians had this you know deep spiritual significance for the sun rising in the east being born and setting in the west going to die not really dying because it's setting to rise again right and then on this side west is completion so now you have the cows have turned the other way you have the back of the cow and you no longer see it and the cow has been slaughtered now you have the leg you have the head so in the east unmanifest potential spirit before it's realized and then on the west you have the death you have the transition so it's a full cycle and you find this east versus west esoteric symbolism all throughout again with the boats that are depicted on the temple walls as well as over here if you look up above the lintel you'll you'll notice if you look up above the lintel it's now faded, but you have the, uh, where is it? Uh, a little difficult to make out in this light. The vulture on one side, uh, on, on this side over here, uh, the leg is unfinished. So it's again, it's 
before creation. And then the leg is finished over here, but the body isn't. So it's one side is finished, one side is left unfinished, but there's always room reserved to complete the full cycle. This is expressed esoterically in the architecture in a whole different way. So if we come over here, you'll notice the columns are round, right? And so the full round is unity, like unity consciousness on the east. And on the west, made manifest, now, now it, ha it comes to a point. Uh, so now you have duality. It's not exactly round like the other column. So again, it's all symbolism is all encoded in the building. This is the actual Holy of Holies here. This was the oldest part of the temple. This is where the priests would have their religion. Here you have the alternating, um, you have the five kings and they're making offerings to Ithophallic, Amun and Amun, every other sequence. The geometries in the kings here is what dictates the whole temple essentially. It's like the first musical note and it dictates, again, every hall, wall and colonnade. This is actually the pineal gland, the third eye of the temple. This is where the priests had their own religion. You see, for the general populace, they believed in the Osirian tradition of renewal, through like, you know, uh, cyclical renewal, like vegetation. You plant the seed, the plant grows, and then it dies, and it drops the seed, and that cycle continues. So everyone believed in the Osirian tradition, but the initiates, the high-level initiates, the priests believed in the Horian tradition that is Horus return to source salvation same principle that Jesus represents but right here is where you have what would be the third eye of the pineal gland and the top of the temple truncates right here the rest of the human head would continue beyond this but this is where you have the uh, von economo neurons which are the neurons in the head that you are to suppress in order to uh, open up your consciousness in a way to connect with the divine to experience gnosis to essentially connect with the divine. That's the underpinning of, yeah, of meditation. Uh, interesting esoteric feature here. Only the initiates would know about this. This is the symbol for fabric here, right? And if you follow this around the wall, even most tour guides are not aware of this. It's a hidden esoteric teaching of transparency. But now we have these boxes where the fabric goes inside, right? And they line up they line up exactly from each side so it's like putting the clothes in the box that's because a vital action takes place here in the temple this corresponding to the human body is where the olfactory system is the olfactory system is where we sense our smell so this is right before the crib, crib but the part just below the part of the brain uh, right above the end of the nose here where you sense smell and because you sense smell that's that's a vital action that takes place so there's part of the esoteric symbolism is you know done through transparency also even in the joints the courses of stone so this is also the, just below the brain the optical center that's where we are in the temple and you'll notice the joints in each course of stone goes right through the eyes so every part of the temple the courses of stone are laid in a way where the joints correspond to that particular part of the body. When you're in the section of the knees, joints go through the knees. When you're in the waist, joints go through the waist. Uh, which also indicate that, you know, if I were to ask you what came first, the stones, the open canvas, or the hieroglyphic relief, you'd probably say the stones. It was actually the vision for the reliefs dictated the courses of stone. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this brief run through the Luxor Temple of Man. This is not the full tour. Uh, I'd literally have to spend eight to 10 hours in here with you to go over everything. But I just wanna give you a few brief salient points so that you can better understand the symbolist approach to the Temple of Man, which my forthcoming book, Esoteric Symbolist Guidebook to the Luxor Temple of Man is all about uh, building upon the work of R.A. Schwal de Lubitz and my mentor, John Anthony West, simplifying it and adding to it as well. Um, you can sign up on my email list at next.com, A-N-Y-E-X-T-E-E.com. Get on the email list to be notified when the book comes out so you can be one of the first to get it. And 
if you enjoyed the video please do considering it a like and if you like the video i suggest you watch the next two videos i put up on the screen because these are the videos youtube thinks you should be watching next